Hey Parasites and welcome back to another episode of the Venom Vlog and I am out she outside where they're filming Venom 2 right now. Hey, what's up everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Venom Vlog and today we're gonna wrap up kind of our, you know, something we've been setting up for a while which is Spider Island because uh, we're going back and looking at the lore of some of these characters. Obviously when there's less movie news we try to dip more back into comic book news and then obviously we have Maximum Venom so there will be some upcoming episodes I think you guys are gonna really like where I have actual interviews uh, with someone who is uh, working on Maximum Venom who is the voice of Venom, Ben Pronsky. So those episodes will be coming up after this. But I wanted to wrap this story up because I promised you guys it for a while and uh, it took me a little bit longer to read it all because this was quite a big graphic novel. I, I bought the digital copy of it a while ago and uh, it's it's full of books. It has like I think like a dozen books in it. And I was like, okay, this is a lot to you know uh, read and a lot to remember. And so I did take a little bit of notes, but mainly my notes are just on the creators that worked on this book because there's a lot of names. And I was like, okay, that's the one thing I'm not going to remember. There might be some events I I screw up or don't get you know 100% accurate. I'm just going off memory here. But I just finished it like two days ago, and I'm like, okay, I can't wait three or four days because I'm going to start forgetting all this stuff, and I'll have to reread it again. And that was just a lot of stuff to reread. So. What we're doing here is where we left off is with, uh, you know, Eddie Brock is anti-Venom now. He signed up with the team called the Revengers. They attacked the Avengers and they kind of won in a way. And they uh, were trying to expose the Avengers for being people with secrets who are broken, who are, you know, who are not good people. And although that can be argued either way for sure, at least in Venom's point of view, he felt that Wonder Man was right, that the Avengers just, you know, they failed too many times, they bring too much danger, they, they bring threats to Earth, and uh, with them around, it's causing a lot of problems. So I kind of like that Eddie Brock had that perspective, you know, but uh, but he has kind of a different role in this one, and we're going to see that. He's going he's gonna to kind of dip back into the religious aspects of uh, Eddie Brock's character in this storyline, which I really like. And then the other Venom that's going around right now, because, you know, Eddie Brock is anti-Venom, the main Venom in the comics is Agent Venom, which is Flash Thompson. And we've already talked about the first five issues of his book and how heartbreaking it was. The last issue uh, dealt with him and his dad and uh, you know, his relationship with Betty Brant. And it's been really great stuff. Rick Remender is killing it on that book. So there's four issues of Venom, issues six, seven, eight, and nine, that all tie into this event that we're going to kind of brush over today. Uh, then we also have Amazing Spider-Man issue 666 all the way up to 673. So that's like a good eight or nine books right there. Uh, those are written by Dan Slott. And uh, art on uh, the first issue and last issue, the um, uh, prologue and epilogue, are Stefano Caselli, I believe is how you say his name. And then uh, the art through ma the main chunk of Spider Island is Humberto Ramos, who uh, I'm a huge fan of. I love Humberto Ramos, especially Crimson. That's what kind of turned me on to that guy. And then Impulse and other stuff he did at DC and then coming over to Marvel. Uh, he's great and he loves Spider-Man. I know he loves drawing Spider-Man and he does a great job in this book. Um, then we also had some tie-in issues. Um, there's some stuff called Infested. It was like a bunch of short stories that were in the back uh, of some issues leading up of Spider-Man, Amazing Spider-Man. And we talked about a couple of them in one of our previous episodes with, uh, you know, with Anti-Venom's return and stuff. But I wanted to kind of brush over those real quickly again because those are by Dan Slott and then uh, Barry Kitson, Lee Garbett, and a bunch of other artists. Every issue had like a different artist on it. So there was a bunch of people that worked and brought those stories to life. So we'll kind of touch on Infested. And then there's these two one-shots. One is, uh, they're uh, kind of labeled as Spider-Man Deadly Foes. And it's a uh, what I did for love is one of the short stories by Fred Van Lente and Mink, uh, Mink Oosterver. Uh, hopefully I'm not uh, butchering your name. And then also we have out of the picture, uh, which is about one of my favorite characters. Both of these shorts are my favorite characters. We have a Gwen Stacy clone and a Kane, you know, bringing back Kane. Uh, and we'll talk about Kane here in a minute. Um, so I love those two characters. And then also Hobgoblin, uh, which is Phil Urich, who is A, my favorite Green Goblin. Uh, he was the Green Goblin in the 90s. And then B, he's also my favorite Hobgoblin. And so he's the current Hobgoblin in this storyline here. And this was written by Dan Slott and Christos Gage and art by Giuseppe Comancoli. And hopefully, again, I'm not butchering uh, Giuseppe's last name there. So yeah, a lot of stuff to uh, dive into here. So we'll start with Infested because that's kind of the setup, right? Like the setup is just you know, Dan, you know, Dan Slott kind of was like, all right, we got to set this big story up. If you go back and actually there's something else you can read that goes along with this, which uh, you can get for free on digital. If you go on Comixology, it's a Daily Bugle newspaper that kind of sets up this Spider Island event. And uh, I always thought that was cool when they use like Daily Planet and Daily Bugles, uh, you know, in DC and in Marvel, when they use those as actual things that, you know, people can get their hands on. I always think that's a great souvenir and a cool thing for collectors. So to actually have a Daily Bugle and uh, read through it like a newspaper, 
newspaper and it tell you about all the stuff that's going on, you know, J. Jonah Jameson becoming mayor um, and all that stuff. He's a big part of this storyline as well. And uh, and you get to see some other stuff peaks at, uh, you know, different parts of the Spider-Man universe to kind of help ease you into this event because it's big. And uh, basically what Dan Slott says is he sat down with Steve Wacker and, and Tom Brennan, I think, and some of the other editors, and they kind of came up with this story. The editors were like, hey, we want to do like a summer blockbuster movie event with Spider-Man. What have you got in mind? We were thinking something along these lines. And then Dan Slott came in and said, well, I have these ideas. And they went back and forth. And what they landed on here was Spider Island. So this is very much a collaborative effort and not, not just between Fred Van Lente, Christos Gage, and some of the other writers like Rick Remender that came in to, you know, play in the sandbox, but also all the editors working together with Dan Slott. And, you know, I know people have mixed feelings on Dan Slott. I think I'm one of the people, one of the many people he has blocked on, uh, on Twitter. But it doesn't matter because I love this story. I think Spider Island is freaking awesome. Uh, it was really fun to reread it. It has a lot of great moments in it with Peter Parker and Spider-Man and also with Venom and Anti-Venom as well. So we're going to get into that. But first, Infested. This was kind of, you know, like I said, they're like little short stories and they, and they collect them all here, which is nice. And they lead up to the Spider Island event. And basically what's going on is the Jackal has returned. And as we know, the Jackal is responsible for cloning Spider-Man and the whole clone saga. And usually when people see him pop up in comics, myself included, I roll my eyes and go, oh God, a Jackal story? This is gonna suck. Uh, but this was actually pretty neat. Uh, what Jackal does is he takes... You know what he's always been interested in like kind of how mr sinister and x-men is always interested in scott summers and uh, and gene gray's dna and like what their bloodlines could produce and what kind of mutant that could make which obviously it makes cable the mutant messiah so you know uh, mr sinister is onto something jackal's always been interested in peter parker's dna mainly because of his infatuation with his student which is really creepy um who was gwen stacy and she was dating peter at the time so uh so yeah jackal's kind of a weirdo creep dude he fell in love with his student and uh and then when when she got really close to Peter Parker, he started to hate Peter. Clone Peter found out that Peter Parker was Spider-Man because obviously the clone gets power. So he made Kane and Kane is the first clone of uh, Peter Parker. And then they, they're, you know, Ben came after that and Spider-Side and then the whole clone saga. Uh, but then obviously, um, you know, he cloned Gwen because she died. That was the main thing is Jackal was in love with the student. And when he found out that she died and that Peter Parker was Spider-Man, he was like, okay, well, I have some of her DNA, but you know, I don't know how it's creepy, I guess in class somehow, maybe she cut her hand on a piece of glass and that was enough for him, I don't know. Creepy dude, uh, but he cloned this student and you know, made her think she was a real Gwen Stacy and kind of kept her in his house and, and uh, you know, and it was, I don't know, it was weird. Uh, and then there's other clones. There was one clone that got away and she called herself Joyce Delaney and you know, or she might've been Joyce Delaney in like a retrofitted body where she looked like Gwen. Very convoluted stuff. So Infested is kind of like trying to, to narrow that down and wrap it up. And basically it's Jackal going, okay, I've been obsessed with Peter Parker this whole time and Gwen and everything. So I'm going to go and uh, do something different. I'm not just going to clone him, but I'm going to do, I'm going to make him less special. You know, that's what I want to do. I want to take away the fact that he's special and that he thinks he's special because he has spider powers and he always beats me and, and beats all the villains and stuff. So he creates this uh, virus because uh, he used to, you know, create, he created a clone of himself at one point and that clone deteriorated and became toxic and was known as carry-on and, and, you know, had a kind of a carry-on virus that would try travel around and make people sick and die. So uh, he was like, let's m mess with viruses again and kind of use what Carrion did and, and what that clone, you know, represented. And let's mix that in with spiders and we'll just send like these bed bugs or whatever, these spiders all over the city and everyone they bite uh, will get, you know, uh, spider powers. And I'll just give everyone in New York, uh, you know, spider powers. Everyone on, you know, New York and New York City Island uh, will get spider powers. And then Spider-Man won't be so special anymore. And then once they get all, all spider powers, I'm going to, you know, he teams up with this woman called the Queen, who is this like, it was funny, uh, you know, that Venom story we talked about called uh, Spider-Man the Hunger and it had Venom in it and it was by Paul Jenkins and Humberto Ramos. Uh, that run of Spectacular Spider-Man, which is a phenomenal run by Paul Jenkins, really, really good stuff. They introduced a woman called the Queen in there. And she was able to take control of like Spider-Man and Captain America. And she had a big beef with the two of them. So that plays into this too, which is really cool. So Dan Slott was like, all right, let's take this villain that no one really did anything with after Paul Jenkins did. And let's bring her back into this and let's tie this all together. So Jackal is teaming up with her. So once everyone's bitten by these spiders and they get spider powers, the queen will essentially control all of them. And then she'll control all of New York and so on and so forth. And then she'll work with Jackal and he'll get to continue his experiments and destroy Spider-Man. And then she'll get to rule, you know, uh, 
uh, Manhattan or you know, all of New York if she wants. And, uh, and that's kind of, so they both get what they want kind of thing. And, uh, and so that's the story. And so Infested sets that up. It has him sending out the spiders and you see regular people all over getting bit. A uh, person about to get mugged, they fight back and they, you know, have spider powers. And then another scene where like a, uh, a you know, a drug deal goes bad and one of the drug dealers turns out he has spider powers now and he beats up the other gang and stuff. And so now it's just out of control. And now it's good people and bad people getting powers and none of them having the responsibility lesson that Peter Parker had. So they all kind of get out of hand and gets out of control. So you see that slowly spread throughout in infested and then meanwhile you have Madam Webb who's been training Peter Parker uh, to be better at fighting so you know Shang Chi who is the master of kung fu is awesome he's a great character he's actually teaching Spider-Man to use um, you know kung fu and learn you know a version of kung fu like spider fu basically and he's the reason he's doing this is because Spider-Man in the comics right now has temporarily lost his spider sense. Something's whacked out on his powers. He can't figure out what's going on. So uh, he's like, I, I can't sense when danger's coming. So Shang Chi's like, well, I'll teach you how to focus your chi and how to, you know, be a kung fu master. So for months and months, while you know Spider Man was an Avenger in Avengers Tower, he's training with Shang Chi, and so that's kind of set up here too. And that's all under the, you know, kind of the uh, tutelage of Madame Web. She's telling Shang Chi, you need to train him. He needs to be ready because what's about to come is he's not ready for, and I, I need him to almost be willing to kill because uh you know the queen is not going to be stopped so easily the jackal is not going to be stopped so easily and this is going to get out of control and there's even threats beyond that if we get through this um that you know are going to also be there so you know madam web is an, in a new body now and she's connected to the web of life and she can kind of see predictions and possible futures and everything and so she's trying to prevent all these bad ones from happening and she needs spider-man to be trained and be ready so that's what you see in Infested also is Spider-Man being trained by Shang-Chi and learning, you know, martial arts and Kung Fu. And it's pretty great because Spider-Man's, you know, he's kind of a scrappy dude, but he's not a fighter, you know, like he's, he reacts with his powers. And I was like, oh, that's such a cool approach. You know, like, let's teach Spider-Man actually how to fight. And that's what Shang-Chi does. And who better? Like, what a great teacher, you know, someone who's so focused and disciplined like Shang-Chi. So that's what Infested is, and that kind of sets up the story. So now New York is starting to spread out and, you know, get, you know, everyone's starting to get spider powers. Spider-Man's starting to train and get kung fu powers. And then meanwhile, you have these one shots like uh, What I Did for Love, which shows one of the Gwen Stacy clones, one of the first ones who started to deteriorate. She's also infected with the carry-on virus, too. So she's kind of turning into a Gwen Stacy Carry on in a way, which I was like, that's a cool thread. I wish that was able to continue and we can make the new carry on like a Gwen Stacy clone. But at the same time, that's a pretty horrifying thing because I'm a Gwen Stacy fan. And, you know, even seeing her in clone form, I'm kind of like, oh, it breaks my heart and it, it's hard and I wouldn't like to see her as a villain. So Spider-Gwen's like a good compromise, another universe version of her and stuff that has spider power. So I'm like, all right, that's a good compromise. My heart doesn't ache when I, you know, read a Spider-Gwen comic. But uh, anytime, other, you know, they bring Gwen in any other story, my heart starts to break a little bit. So maybe it's a good thing they didn't do that. So anyway, so this Gwen, she comes back and she's killing uh, Joyce Delaney, the one you know who lives in France, who thinks she might be a new you know a new clone, or she was a clone, or a retrofitted clone, or something that the High Evolutionary created. So there's all these you know all those storylines that were from the past are being wrapped up here in this one shot, and it basically comes down to the Jackal is resurrecting Kane because Kane, for those who don't know, he died in a storyline recent to this where they resurrected like oh you know these villains like the family of Craven uh, the Hunter resurrected their father Craven. But he needed to kill a Spider-Man to kind of switch places with him so he could officially come back into the real world. He kills Spider-Man, but it turns out it's not Spider-Man. It was Kane in Spider-Man's costume uh, who died for Spider-Man. And, uh, and by doing that, it kind of cursed Craven. So he's stuck on Earth in limbo, but like his full soul didn't come over or something like that. And uh, so it wasn't like an even transfer because Kane was a clone who does have a soul, obviously, but... You know, it's like a, it's like one that's growing still, right? Like, you know, it's, it's, he wasn't, when he was created, he didn't have it initially, but he's just kind of developed a soul over the years. So it wasn't an even transfer. So, you know, Cain did die, but unfortunately, you know, Craven is, and also Craven's still stuck on earth. He hates it. He's mad that he got resurrected in an improper way, especially, and he, you know, blames his kids for that screw up. But now we have Craven the Hunter back in the world and, uh, you know, and, and we have Kane in the ground. Well, Jackal resurrects Kane and brings him back as the new Tarantula and mutates him into a giant, you know, man spider monster, which I thought was pretty cool. And that's kind of his right hand guard. Then they also have the Queen helps, uh, you know, Jackal kidnap someone else. We don't see who it is at first. And they turn this person into the Spider King. So Spider King and Tarantula are Jackal's right and left hand knights, essentially. 
and then you have the queen above all three of them, you know, above Jackal and the, and the other two. So uh, so that's our players. The, Quen, the Gwen clone, she tries to come in and kill Jackal for everything he's done and for everything he's about to do because she finds out about his plans. And, uh, and Jackal does get the one up on her. They both get trapped under a beam. And then Kane, being the tarantula, comes over and Jackal's like, save me. And then, you know, Gwen is like, no, save me. He's going to hurt people. He's going to hurt you. I'll find a way to transfer you back to your human form. You know, like, uh, but, you know, I'm your sister. And Jackal's like, yeah, but I'm your father. And so in the end, Tarantula, because he has a warped mind or, you know, Kane has a warped mind, he saves Jackal. And uh, so you're like, oh, this event was this close to not actually happening because Gwen, you know, could have been saved in a what if comic. That would be great to see if, you know, Tarantula actually saved that cl a clone of Gwen and then Spider Island never happened. That'd be a really interesting story. So, um, so yeah, Jackal's been saved by Tarantula, and now they go rejoin, you know, the Queen, and they start running over New York. And there's a lot to go over, so I'm going to try to skip some things, and I'm not going to be as detailed for, for some things as well, because this is a big story, and I don't want this episode to run past 30 minutes, and we're already 15 minutes in, and we're just now kind of getting to the main story. Uh, but that's really what the main story is. It's everyone in New York starts getting spider powers, and Spider-Man has to deal with that. And uh, he has to deal with his, his girlfriend, Carly Cooper. She's a detective. We talked about her before. She gets spider powers. Uh, Mary Jane Watson, towards the end of the story, her finally, her powers start kicking in. Then Peter Parker, even at one point, um, it you know jumps out and and reacts and has powers and his and he's like doing kung fu and he's doing all these things that he learned from Shang Chi. And his girlfriend's like, "Wait, you just got your powers?" And he's like, "Yeah, why?" And she's like you're really good at using them like everyone else seems to be fumbling and, and you know even carly herself took time to like you know get uh, better at using the powers and uh, and meanwhile peter picked it up right away and he gives this big speech like hey new york you know like you, we need to learn about power and responsibility and he kind of gives his big speech and so there's like half of new york who gets spider powers they start doing bad things they're breaking into you know banks and they're doing all these things that you know they're hurting people uh they're fighting the avengers like the avengers you know have to come in and try to clean up new york and they're getting their butts kicked by a bunch of spider people and or they're having a tough time they're not losing but they're having a very tough time fighting all these people with spider powers and uh and it even gave some of them respect uh, for spider-man a little bit more because they're like wow this kid probably could take down a lot of us uh, and these are untrained people with his powers imagine what spider-man now trained by shang chi he could probably do some real damage to us um but spider-man does jump into the fray and try to help out but he jumps in as spider-man in the beginning of the story and then towards the end of the story he helps out as peter parker and that ends, ends up being a big story point for him because as you know and and you know one more day and brand new day and stuff he made a deal with uh, you know Doctor Strange to erase everyone's memory that remembered that he was Peter Parker. So anytime they think of the moment they saw Spider-Man without a mask, there's like a blur over his face and they can't remember who he is. Well, unfortunately, by Peter doing this thing where he goes on national TV and says, hey, everyone, you know, I'm Peter Parker. I'm just a regular dude, but I, like you, have spider powers temporarily, it seems. Uh, so, of course, he's using what's currently happening in the world as a lie uh, to kind of rally people together. He gives them the big power and responsibility speech, and then a lot of people decide to team up with him. And it's really cool because there's this great image of him swinging, and there's like a woman swinging next to him, and there's like a guy in a UPS outfit, you know, and uh, it's just like every, everyday regular people. And I like that. I was like, oh, that's cool. So everyone kind of rallies behind Peter Parker, you know, and decides to do heroic things, and including Mary Jane and everyone else. So, yeah, it's, it's really fun. There's a lot of stuff that happens in the story that are really big moments for a lot of characters. Um, we also have Venom, meanwhile, Agent Venom. Uh, in the six or the four issues that tie into this uh, by Rick Remender, Tom Fowler, and Stefano. Um, these ones are pretty, you know, pretty intense because you're dealing with Flash and the aftermath of his father, you know, and his father's, you know, dead at this point, and Betty Brant is there, and she's trying to console him, uh, but he's also getting missions to go back in and, and fight in New York and save people, and he's doing a great job, and, and it's funny because he shows up, and he saves, like, Firestar and Gravity and a couple other, like, teenage superheroes, and they're like, uh, hey, thanks, and he's like, they're like, who are you again? He's like, uh, don't worry about it, you know, he's like, because no one really knows him as Venom, and that was cool because in this, you know, trade paperback, they show some of those interviews, and in that, you know, Daily Beagle newspaper, they show interviews with Rick Remender and Dan Slott, and, like, you know, ask them questions about the event and what these characters are going to go through and it was really cool to kind of peek behind the story while also reading the story i thought that was really neat that they did that in the trade paperback and had those forms in there you know like those backup interviews in there but then also had them in that newspaper and it was kind of cool to bookend it like that and i was like oh great i feel like i understand more about this event now and kind of what they were going for and rick Amender said that most people don't know that spider-man or that you know venom is venom like that flash thompson venom 
they don't know he's called Venom. That he just shows up. He's kind of got a different look. You know, he's got a spider on his chest, but they don't really know what he's all about. They don't. They don't know what name he goes by or anything like that. Like Peter Parker and Spider Man has encountered him and know he's Venom, but until his tongue comes out, and everything people don't know what he is. He looks like Punisher, you know, kind of like a derivative of the Punisher or Spider Man. Like so, people aren't sure about him. So when he shows up to save the day, they're like, "Thanks, guy." Like we don't know who you are. Um, so, you know, so he, Flash gets into the storyline here and he's given a specific mission, the Spider King. Something's up with the Spider King. He's able to, you know, uh, have influence over certain things. He was a top priority uh, for Jackal and the Queen. And, you know, they don't and the government doesn't know, you know, know why. Um, there's also heroes that are missing from the battle. They're like, hey, where's some of these other heroes like Avengers characters are missing. And they're like, we need to get to the bottom of this. We think the, the Spider King has, uh, you know, has maybe captured some of our heroes, you know, and so we need to go stop him, find out where he's kept these other heroes that he, you know, might have kidnapped, and we need to free them so that way the odds kind of tip back in our favor. So, you know, that's what your job is, Agent Venom. You got to go in and take down the Spider King. So he does, and he dives in, and like the first two issues of Sp uh, Venom, it was like issue six and seven, he's fighting the Spider King, and it is an intense battle. And Spider King is like, he's like Man Spider, you know, but he's, he's a little bit bigger than Tarantula, bigger than Kane, and they're just going at it and it's intense and they're fighting back and forth and then spider king jumps into the main battle and he's taking out heroes and then venom shows up or agent venom shows up to take him down again and they just keep going at it and, and they're fighting people and then meanwhile while they're fighting you have eddie brock showing up on the scene and he is curing people because he's anti-venom and that's what he wanted to do with spider-man he wanted to suck the radiation out of him so he's running around in, you know, because he can sense all these people now have spider powers and they're kind of irradiated in a way and they have a virus in them and he can sense that because that's his new power. It's his new, like, uh, you know, man-made symbiote thing or whatever it is that Mr. Negative created out of him. It can sense all this virus. So he's going around taking the powers away from people and there's people that are like, dude, I was swinging around like Spider-Man. You suck. And he's like, he's like, you'll thank me later. And he knows you don't want the life that, you know, Spider-Man has or whatever. And he's just going around. He's like, you don't want this virus in you. It's going to get worse. And it does. Over time, people start mutating like Shocker. He grows like six arms, like six arms Spider-Man style. And he grows six arms. He's got like six gauntlets out. But then he starts mutating into a spider and it's getting out of control. And so everyone's slowly turning into like Tarantula and Spider King. And once they turn into that form, the queen has complete control over them. And so it's a lot worse than even Jackal thought it was going to be. So he's kind of been double crossed and he kind of, you know, turn, they turn on each other, him and the queen. But Jackal has his hands full, you know, when uh, when he sees that the Spider King is being taken down by Agent Venom. And he's like, who is this? Like, what? I don't know this player. I, I didn't plan for him. What is going on? And once, you know, Agent Venom takes down Spider King, he actually brings him back to the government and they start, you know, working on him and trying to demutate him and figure out who he was. And they find out that the Spider King is actually Captain America. And Captain America being the first super soldier that, and, and also being an enemy of the Queen, she wanted revenge on him for what happened in those earlier spectacular Spider-Man issues. So they kidnapped him first. They went after him first when he least suspected it. And they took him down, uh, caught him by surprise, and then they experimented on him and turned him into the first man spider, you know, that they were going to use, the Spider King. And once they saw that it worked on him, they were like, okay, now we can perfect it and make it work on every other normal human being as well. And then also give them kind of a, you know, a boost in power like Cap has when they become into their spider forms. And then I'll have a whole army of like super soldier spider people. Uh, so yeah, kind of a silly, you know, uh, very cheesy 50s kind of movie plot, uh, turn everyone into spiders and take over the world. Uh, but I loved it. I thought it was really good. And uh, and so, yeah, so you have Captain America revealed now. And now that he's back into his human form, he's going to go jump back into the fight. And while he jumps back in, that's when Venom comes across Anti-Venom, who is hanging out in the church. Eddie Brock is hanging out in the church where he first became Venom. So I love that little plot thread where he goes back to where it all began. He goes to that church and he sees a bunch of people praying, asking for their spider powers to be taken away because people are starting to mutate. There's like a guy with his daughter and uh, she's starting to mutate and everything. And so he's like, I can't have my little girl turn into a monster please help us please god and they're all going to, to you know to pray to god for help and that's when eddie brock shows up and he's like i'll be your savior i'll be your salvation and people come up one at a time almost like communion style and he's curing them of uh, being you know mutated spiders and then you know that's when agent venom shows up and they get into a tussle but then agent venom sees what he's doing he's like wait you're actually helping people and he goes of course i am and he goes and then he goes hey hq guess what i have a cure and they're like a cure and he goes yes uh, anti-venom can cure people of the spider disease and they're like great 
uh, Reed Richards is working with us now. So Reed Richards decides to team up with the government, you know, and help out, you know, Agent Venom's group. And then they also bring in Horizon Labs. So you get uh, Max Modell, and then you also get uh, the, you know, the secret uh, scientist number six. Because remember, there's six scientists that work for Horizon Labs, and Peter's one of them, and then there's a couple other people. I think Anna Marie might have been one of them. I can't remember. But there was like five scientists, and then there was a sixth one that nobody ever met. They were like, why is number six a secret like he stays in his lab we don't know who he is and uh, and they know it's a he because sometimes he comes out in a hazmat suit and they can hear his voice but they're like who is you know scientist six we don't know who it is so in this one we find out who scientist six is which is really cool because scientist six comes in and goes all right you know let's hook eddie brock up to this machine we'll tap into the anti-venom you know serum and we'll create uh, a cure and we're going to send it out all over new york and we're going to put them in these uh i think spider-man's like i have these auto octavius bots so he takes auto octavius helmet and there's these little octo bots and he's like okay since there's little spiders running around that infected everyone now all those spiders are dead obviously we're going to send little octo bots out and cure everyone and he goes we need this you know the serum and stuff from eddie brock's dna so eddie brock is willing to sacrifice his life to save all of new york which i thought was freaking awesome like he New York turned against Eddie Brock, if you remember, when they, you know, they cancel cultured him. They they told him he was no longer worthy of having his job. He was a bad journalist. And they they got rid of him. You know, he lost his house. You know, he lost his health. You know, he had cancer. He was going to kill himself. And then he became Venom. And, uh, and he really still protected innocent people after that and only blamed Spider-Man. But you know a part of him had to feel some sort of hatred. I mean, it, you know, beyond his hatred for Spider-Man to the city on some level because he's like, yeah, this place turned against me. And here he is, you know, willing to give his own life and give up the anti-venom, you know, uh, symbiote, essentially, whatever, you know, whatever it is. It's not really a symbiote, but it's like a part of him, an extension of him. And there's a chance that if he gets rid of all of it, it could kill him because that's kind of maybe keeping him alive, too. And so he's like, no, I'm willing to make the sacrifice to save all of New York. So big Eddie Brock moment here. And Flash Thompson gets to see that with the suit. And, you know, and they, they even uh, put the suit over Eddie uh, when he's anti-venom and use it to calm him down. And then, you know, and then the suit comes back to Flash. And there's kind of a mutual respect moment there, like, you know, of Eddie and Flash kind of like, all right, the suit picked a good, you know, person to go to kind of thing, you know. And then Eddie's, you know, and then the, you know, Flash is like, yeah, well, you're about to make the biggest sacrifice in the world and save everybody. So this is amazing of you too. So yeah, there's like a nice little mutual respect there. And then it goes back to, you know, the main storyline. There's a, another one shot called Out of the Picture, which is like a Hobgoblin story. Phil Urich, who, like I said, he's my favorite Hobgoblin and Green Goblin. And uh, he, it shows him hitting on this girl who works at the Daily Bugle with Peter. And her boyfriend is like a Joe Robbie Robertson's son, I think. And they're kind of in a relationship. But in this one, he gets spider powers and he's about to get killed by Hobgoblin. And she's just recording it because she's a journalist and that's what she wants. And so her boyfriend's about to die and she doesn't do anything to help him or save him. She doesn't even try to figure out if she has spider powers. There's like hobgoblin bombs near her. She doesn't even pick him up to save her boyfriend. She's just videotaping. She's re about ready to film him die. And uh, and so it shows her in a really negative light. And then he, after he gets away from Hobgoblin, he's like, look, we're, me and you, we're done. I'm, he's like, you almost let me die. Like there was bombs next to you. There's a, but you might even have spider powers. Why didn't you save me? And she goes, I'm sorry, I wanted the story. And he goes, the story? He's like, I was going to die. Like, And she's like, well, sorry, that's what I do. I sit back and I'm an observer. I don't interact with people. Um, I just observe. And so he's like, screw you, we're done. And then he leaves. And then, you know, Hobgoblin changes back into Phil Urich, who has, you know, he's had a crush on this girl for a while. And he's been trying to win her over. Here, all he had to do was attack her boyfriend. And, uh, and you know, that would have won her over because she, after, you know, her boyfriend leaves, Phil comes up and kisses her. And then she bites him on the lip and he's like, what's that for? And she goes, because if you're going to be with me, you need to know that uh, it's going to be dangerous. And, uh, you know, if you're put in harm's way, you know, I'm st I'm going to film everything. It's all for the story. And Phil's like, I can appreciate that. And don't worry about me. I'm never going to be in danger because obviously he's a cocky dude who's the hobgoblin. He doesn't think he's going to, you know, lose his life anytime soon. Sadly, he does eventually, but not anytime soon. Uh, so yeah, so they kind of hook up. So anyway, I was like, oh, that's a neat little chapter in here. But the main story goes back to Spider-Man, you know, and as Peter Parker, teaming up with everybody, teaming up with Mary Jane, J. Jonah Jameson even gets spider powers, but then he starts to mutate. So they have to like, you know, uh, hold him down. He's starting to turn into a man spider. Uh, he bites Alistair Smythe on the shoulder, or, or Smythe's son, uh, the spider slayer, bites him on the shoulder when he's trying to interrogate him. And, uh, you know, and it, it's 
there's a lot of crazy stuff like because they talk about Jonah and his approval ratings going down being the mayor and everything uh, so he has to you know uh, step up and he's like no I'm, I'm gonna save the city now that I have spider powers I'm gonna save the city but again he goes too far hurts Smythe and then starts mutating and Spider-Man has to save him too and cure him with the anti-venom serum and then in the end, uh, the queen, she absorbs everything she can. She becomes like a giant 50-foot monster, uh, you know, spider monster that they got to fight. And that's where Venom and Captain America come in and they take the fight to her. And then Spider-Man, while you know, and that's the cool thing is Venom, Agent Venom, and Captain America are the two that get into the big fight at the end with some of the Avengers. But it's the two of them side by side fighting against the Queen. And I was like, that's awesome. And then meanwhile, Peter Parker saves the world as Peter Parker because he went and talked to Scientist Six. Scientist Six, turns out, is Morbius the living vampire, so he knows a lot about, you know, trying to cure viruses. He's been unable to cure himself of his disease, but he's able to use anti-venom to cure everybody else, so it's a step towards maybe his goal as well. And, uh, and so Spider-Man takes all those serums, puts them in the Octobots, goes up to a tower, puts the helmet on, and, you know, finds a way to cure all of New York before they turn it into giant spiders. And then the queen gets taken down by, you know, Venom or Agent Venom and, uh, and you know, Captain America. And then Eddie Brock, on the other hand, he's, uh, you know, looks like he's one inch away from losing his life. But luckily he survives. And on the news at the end, you have Captain America, you know, congratulating and thanking Eddie Brock and J. Jonah Jameson, saying that he was the hero of everything because he was anti-Venom. And he provided the serum that, uh, you know, Peter Parker and other people used to save the day. So uh, so I thought that was pretty cool. Uh, this is a really great story. It wraps up really nicely. And it's a, it's fun. Like, it's a lot of fun seeing people run around with spider powers. Uh, of course, Spider-Man, you know, his girlfriend kind of suspected that he used his powers a little too easily, that he was too good at them. And she confronts him about that. He reveals that he is Spider-Man uh, to her. And then she breaks up with him. She's like, you've been lying to me this whole time. Don't worry, I'm not going to tell your secret to anybody. But you and I are done. I knew when you got the those powers used them too well so she kind of leads his life and then he goes back and talks to dr strange he goes what happens now like carly kind of knows who i am and then he goes yeah and dr strange goes you went on national tv and showed everybody you had spider powers and even though that wasn't you admitting you were spider-man you still kind of did a public thing so that weakened my spell so now uh everyone is so spider-man's like is everyone going to remember who i i was now like everyone who knew before and he goes no he's like they're not going to remember but now they'll have the ability to because i had a protection spell over you that if you took your mask off people couldn't see you know your face you know they couldn't remember your face and then they couldn't see it if you showed it to them there would be a blank you know uh, face there uh and he goes but now that spell is weakened so if you take your mask off now People are going to see your face. They're going to know you're Peter Parker. So, uh, so the stakes are very high. But at the end, there's a great moment where the last person Spider-Man has to cure is the last person who got powers, which was Mary Jane. And they have this great moment on the roof because, you know, obviously he broke up with Carly or she left him. But there's still Dan Slott has been doing a really good song and dance back and forth with uh, Peter and Mary Jane. And Mary Jane, I thought, in this storyline was really great. Like, she, normally she's a character. I feel like some writers don't know what to do with her. But seeing her in this and seeing her with spider powers and seeing her have fun and, uh, and kind of understand Peter on that level more and understand what his life is like more you know risking his life to save people and she does that and she saves people in this story and so at the end when he cures her they have this great moment where you know they don't kiss but uh, but they stand together and she shows them that you know uh you know empire state building or something is lit up with blue and red lights and it's basically new, new york saying thank you to spider-man for uh, you know for playing a part in curing people with anti-venom's cure and stuff so yeah really great stuff big story a lot of big moments in it and uh, a lot of great stuff in there for, you know, Agent Venom, who got to save the day with Captain America and be considered a hero and definitely elevated his status as hero. Eddie Brock, who put his life on the line to save all of New York and gets the recognition for it. So that, you know, elevated him in that way. And then you have Spider-Man being thanked by New York, too. So a win-win for everybody. And of course, the Queen is taken down, but the Jackal does get away. Uh, and he does. Uh, the Tarantula does not, though. He unfortunately uh, loses control of Tarantula and Tarantula turns back into Kane. He gets cured by Anti-Venom. And he gets turned back into Kane without the scar on his face. So now he looks just like Peter Parker. So the last thing that happens in this book is Kane going, hey, Peter, I, I took one of your suits, you know, your big time light black and, you know, green suit. I'm going to take that with me. I'm going to modify it. And I'm going to go, I'm going to leave New York and going to go do my own thing and, run, you know, have my own life. And, uh, and Peter's like, well, I guess good luck. He's like, you know, I, I guess I can't stop you. And he's like, no, you can't. And then, you know, Kane goes off in his own way and starts his own series written by Chris Yost, which is amazing. One of my favorite runs of all time. And we're definitely going to talk about it coming up because it crossed over with Agent Venom in a story called Minimum Carnage. So we'll definitely get there very soon, too. So let me know what you think. Have you read Spider Island? I think this is one of the best Spider-Man stories Dan Slott has written. It's definitely one of my favorite. I think it is my favorite Dan Slott story. I like some of his other ones. Uh, there's ups and downs in his run. 
This one I think is the top. I mean, I had so much fun rereading this and, and you know enjoying it again. And if you haven't, I highly suggest you do it. Go check this book out. It's amazing. You can get it on Comixology. You can get it in print somewhere, I'm sure. And, uh, you know, Spider Island, you get the whole thing in one. And definitely look on Comixology for that Daily Beagle newspaper. That's a really cool thing, too, because it gives you a little peek behind the curtain of how this story was made, and that's a lot of fun as well. Thanks so much. Let me know your comments down below, and we'll continue our conversation down there. See you guys in the future. Peace.